Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 53 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined by my friend and partner, Pervez Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good to be back, listeners. Uh, looking forward to today's conversation. I know, Zaki, hey, big news. You just got back from, what, your 10th high school reunion? No, a 20-year Oh, I'm sorry. But, hey, man, know. I was trying to make you look younger, dude. Well... I just got invited to my 25th, so... Okay. Yeah, there you go. Wow, really? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Are you, are you planning to go? I want to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I just got back. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very tired, but <laughs> it, it was a productive uh, trip through time for me as I, as I walked through uh, my empty high school, and uh, they took us on a tour of the old place. Oh, nice, and It nice. was really cool. So it was, it was, it was a good experience, but... Uh, you but reconnected I, with your humble uh, Midwestern roots. That's right. I, I tried to, I tried to uh, uh, dip my beak in in there every once in a while, just to you know, uh, but it, but it, I'm I'm fighting jet lag to be here and doing the show. That's awesome. the, that's the kind of dedication I have. Well, and I think our today's guest has something to do with it. It's true. If anyone is worth fighting jet lag for, it's, <laughs> it's John O'Brien, uh, my old friend John O'Brien. That's I feel right. I feel comfortable saying. Yes, I, I attended John's wedding many moons ago, and uh, I think in terms of all the guests we've recorded with, John is one of the. My, my longest lived relationships so that's pretty cool uh, more so, I think it's it's like Azhar Usman and John <laughs> there you go not even you I've known John longer than I've known you yeah think about that for a second that's right. yeah think about it <laughs> right. uh, but John is an assistant professor of sociology at New York University of Abu Dhabi he's a sociologist whose research and teaching interests include culture religion social identity, immigration, ethnicity, and Islam and Muslims. His new book, Keeping It Halal, The Everyday Lives of Muslim American Teenage Boys, comes out September 5th from Princeton Press and is a three-and-a-half-year ethnographic study of a group of Muslim teenagers coming of age in post-9-11 America. His articles have been published in the journals Sociological Theory, Poetics, Social Psychology Quarterly, and Contexts. At NYUAD, he teaches courses on religion and society, Islam and society, and ethnographic fieldwork. John, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So we want to talk about the book. Mm-hmm. There's lots to talk about. We will get there in, in just a second. But while we have you here, uh, I think we can't talk about the American Muslim experience without as we do, it seems like every episode talking about the current goings on with with the Trump administration. Now we're we're recording the day after uh, President Trump announced the expansion of of or the continuation, I should say, of the war in Afghanistan. We're we're two weeks after the the Charlottesville uh, uh, neo Nazi uh, rally that he came out uh, in support of, despite his protestations to the contrary. So my question to you, as an American. Uh, living overseas, living in the Middle East, mm-hmm. uh, what was the reaction like to to President Trump's election? I mean, you, you were there yeah. when it happened. Yeah, we were there. Uh, we've lived there for five years now, and uh, we were. There's a lot of Americans who work on the campus, and so we were having sort of a watching the returns party at five in the morning. We were very shocked, like many people here were, when it turned. Uh, that Trump was going to win. And so we sort of ha- started having these informal meetings of people over there just to sort of process it because there's no clear um, action to take in terms of going to your you know local march or things like that. Although we, people have found out, okay, you can call your senators you know, via Skype and things like that. So we've had to get creative about it. And in fact, my wife's gotten more involved with this group called Democrats Abroad, which is trying to get more people to vote who are, live overseas because many of them don't know how, how to do it. Right. Um, so... But definitely many people over there are, uh, f- you know, I have to field a lot of questions about how could your country elect this person and things like that, which are difficult to answer. <laughs> mm. um, and I've, from what I've read since Charlottesville, there's been even more sort of condemnation of Trump, I think, from different world leaders who before were not being so bold against him. So The the yeah. sad thing to me is that we're now about, about two weeks away from Charlottesville, and it sure feels like we're moving on to the next thing. Like it, it feels like this is yet another thing mm. that we've just sort of said. Yeah, he's a white supremacist. Anyway, moving on. Uh, you know, it, it, I'm I'm tired of all the news articles that are something to the effect of, "Well, this is it. This is going to be the thing. Mm-hmm. It's all over now." Mm. It's not. Uh, yeah. And and you know I we've think seen we need two to, plus years of it, right? Because I mean, yeah. not only the seven months since his election, but even his campaign, right? I mean, every 
campaign gaffe was not a gaffe, or we later find out that it's not a major gaffe, and it's not right. going to be a game it, changer. It's not gaffe enough. Gaffe enough, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the, a new meaning to the Teflon presidency. So right. it's, you know. it's extraordinary. I was reading an article yesterday, which I'm sure you all have seen, that the Secret Service has run out of money mm-hmm. for the rest of the year. And, you know, the, the question you ask, again, let's imagine for a second that this is Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. And seven months into his first year, they just ran out of money. Do we? Th- I mean, you know what I mean? Right. Of course. At, at what point does does uh, relativism fade away and we say, "Look, what's right is right." At this mm-hmm. moment. And there is no point, at least that we're seeing. So we haven't hit that part yet. Well, I mean, if, if you look at his, I mean, his, his where he's polling and, and and his sort of favor favor favorability versus unfavorability ratings. Those are, I think, ind- indicative of what you're talking about. What, sure. what gets me is his base that remains unchanging and, and, and just, you know, uncompromising in their support of him. You, you know what's interesting, um, though, is that what we are, I mean, irrespective of, of his base, uh, you look at the Trump effect in terms of his party. I mean, I was looking at some polling out of, out of uh, Kentucky that says that Mitch McConnell is polling at like 17% in hmm. Kentucky. Right, not a national poll yeah. because he's a reviled person. I think Voldemort is more popular than Mitch McConnell nationally. But in his home state, wow, seven. Like, how does that happen? You That's know right. what I mean? That's right. So, so I I do think that there is a story that will potentially be told in the midterms about the the you know the opposite of coattails, whatever that is, uh, mm. in in terms of the election. I read an interesting article today in the Washington Post about how, of course, the internal debates within the Democrats, because that seems like another important piece that needs to be figured out pretty yeah. soon, because it's not going to work to just ride on Trump's a hor- horrible person That's if right. there's no... They tried that. Well, clearly, they, it, they, they didn't work. tried that for the election. <laughs> they right? tried that in the election. Exactly. Uh, the, the anti-Trump didn't right. work. I mean, I, it's, you know, Hillary Clinton's entire, uh, or a big chunk of her campaign message was... Come on, what what do you want? Trump as president? You know, and it occurs to me, like, you know, as an attorney, you never ask a question. You don't already know the answer to <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right, right. Wow. So, um, anyway, I think we can spend hours probably talking we about could. this. We could. And just sort of, yeah. But But I actually, I yeah. do think, I, I think this this allows for a segue yeah. because, uh, obviously, in, in so far as a big... A big part of Trump's appeal is is nativism, and and this this populist message directed uh, at the other. Mm-hmm. And your book is very much about not de-otherizing the other, mm-hmm. I suppose. And so maybe in as as we go dive into the roots of the book, maybe we can dive into the roots of your own narrative that led you to writing this book. Sure. Correct. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and it's funny because whenever I talk about this book and people say, how did you get access to this site? And then I talk about how I'm a Muslim and then they say, oh, how did that happen? And then I go back and even actually, I'm, I'm prepared to tell the story because even with the publishers or, you know, they send your manuscript out for a review for different people and they said, oh, you need to really tell this story. So it's in the book. So now I know how to tell it. Although I guess I did before. Um, but anyway, so I um, converted to Islam in 2003 um, that was definitely influenced by meeting my wife, who mm-hmm. uh, is a Muslim, and I knew wanted to marry a Muslim person, and who sort of taught me about the religion. Um, but I also was sort of a spiritually inclined, religiously interested person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and we went to church fairly often, but sort of, in a lot of ways, my parents were turned off to the church by political differences they had with almost every church we would attend, mm-hmm. be it about gender issues or or different political differences. So we sort of fell off of that. Although my mother, I think, is the classic um, Catholic who feels bad about not going to church. So that was still part of our conversation was religion. So I sort of wanted to find, I think, sort of a framework and a, and a practice. And then when I met my wife in college, learned about Islam from her, that was much earlier than um, us getting married. So we were friends for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, anyway, so in 2003, uh, right around here in San Francisco, I uh, converted to Islam and have been, you know, learning before, since, and and um, and I think that's part of how I was interested in this project. Also, I always tell people I didn't convert to do the project. That would be really <laughs> a level of commitment that I was not, uh, you know. But um, 
but so yeah, so I, I went to grad school for sociology, and uh, I really was interested in this this method, which they call ethnography, which is when you go and just spend time with a group of people over years and just see what their life is like, and sort of just basically say what's happening with them and try to analyze their situation in society. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually originally had wanted to study a, a Muslim Jewish dialogue group that was uh, around where I was studying because mm-hmm. that was I thought, an interesting thing, but. They actually didn't meet often enough for me to do it. There's some practical things about the method, which is you have to be able to go somewhere for once a week and spend hours and hours with people. Um, so anyway, so uh, but I was I knew that it was it was at that point it was about 2006. So of course you know 9/11 was five years earlier, hmm. um, and I had never regularly attended a mosque. I'd gone to gym in various places, but I I heard of a mosque that I thought was very interesting, so I went to go. Um, to try to do this project, which was really for a class originally, and then turned into um, my dissertation. So in my first year of grad school, I sort of went to this mosque, and a a friend of a friend, uh, my wife's friend sort of was connected to the mosque, so I had sort of an in that way. Um, And I think when they heard I was a Muslim, that helped a little bit. Um, And then I just started focusing on this one group of kids who went there. Uh, I wasn't sure what the focus was going to be, so my, my approach to the method, which I was trained in, is really to sort of be open about what you might focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what I thought might be the main story wasn't the main story. So in some ways I was thinking discrimination, harassment might be sort of the number one thing that's happening here. Um, And it was going on some. And of course, if I did it now, it may be different because of Trump. But even so, Mm -hmm. I think it was important to learn that actually these are people with a lot of things going on. And even if there is Islamophobia that's not their entire life or what they're all about. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Right, um, right. Uh, no, I mean, it, it, well, I mean, there's so much I, I wanted to kind of delve into. And I, I mean, you, you, it's funny because you're going through a lot of the notes that I took while I was reading. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, I didn't get to read as much of the book as I would have wanted before the show. Yeah. Um, but um, we're really, I'm really looking forward to delving into it once it does come out. Um, yeah, yeah, it's funny you do talk about that. Um, you know that the pri- that you thought that the primary concern, kind of going in, was that you assumed that Muslim identity would be defined by their experiences with discrimination and harassment. Mm-hmm. And however, what you found was that their primary con- concern was the ongoing management of competing acts of Muslim and American cultural expectations. That's right. So maybe mm-hmm. kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, and, and again, I want to make clear, and I think the book makes clear, this isn't sort of a clash of civilizations. <laughs> this isn't a, you know, some people say... Huntington yeah, take two. No, exactly. I mean, I, I want to say, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I mean, no. I really wanted to say at the outset was that, uh, you know, like your book, or again, as much of your book as I've read, um, and I, there was another book that I found also very kind of defining in terms of my own formative experience, mm. was Irina Graywall's book, yeah. uh, Islam is a Foreign Country, yeah, just being able to relate book. to those, to the kind of, and again, very similar approach, ethno- ethnographic, yeah. kind of spends time with these students who are studying abroad, but that the, the experience she captures there and the experiences you're able to capture here, it's... Not exactly like looking into a mirror because I mean my formative period is pre nine eleven and obviously that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. However, just kind of being able to see someone from an academic perspective study the experiences of second generation immigrants like myself has mm. just been amazing. So mm. you know, for me, you know, I, I consider myself very fortunate to have sort of lived long enough where you see sort of your life story being studied now academically. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's certainly a sign of age. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But, um. No, but that's, that's very validating because a lot of people, you know, that's... I remember talking to this other professor who's written yeah. some great stuff, and she said, if people in your audience... And this happens to me all the time when I give talks. Someone in the back will come up to me who's a Muslim mm-hmm. young person in college and say, wow, that was exactly what it was like where I was. And, yeah. and th- that's very validating because one of the... The challenges of ethnography, of course, is you're only looking at one site and even one group of people. So the sort of challenge you can hear from academics is often, which is often valid, can you generalize from this? What if this is an exception? Right. Um, but I do think that it's it's nice to hear that there are there is a sort of thread. And people, of course, deal with it in different ways. And different mosques and different parents make a difference. Hmm. Um, and so clearly there are variables that could make... And I think in, in my case, I had sort of a... A happy story of you know, which is again something you don't see that much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like Muslims in a, in a happy, just a sort of regular life way, um, dealing with sort of everyday issues. But I think the, the and we can talk about this more. But I think the mosques and the parent, the mo- this particular mosque, the leadership and the parents, and maybe even the place where it was, 
uh, gave a sort of openness to these sort of navigations to take place, mm -hmm. where I think you hear other stories, which are probably less common, but where um, there's either extreme prejudice against the Muslims or extreme strictness on the family side, which can also lead to sort of... Um, a sort of more con conflict situation for the young people, right? Because so because in the book, I mean, the 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 uh, specific group that you are talking about, you you sort of study the lives or, or you follow the lives of seven youth, mm -hmm. um, ages eleven through seventeen, uh, Somali. What yeah, you had one one Somali kid, two South Asians, two Arabs, mm -hmm. Jordanians, sorry, yeah. and. And actually, yeah, actually, yeah, two Somali. Yeah, yeah, there were two sets of brothers. Oh, yeah, two Somali brothers, two Jordanian brothers, and then um, two South Asian kids. And uh, and you know, this is tricky because you have to keep confidentiality. So the and more of course. specific I get, but um, but yeah, it's it's one thing that's very rare. I think about the mosque I was at is that it is very ethnically mixed. Okay. Um, and most people would say to me, oh, when I say I'm studying mosque, oh, is it a Pakistani mosque? Is it a this mosque? Is it that mosque? And I think. One thing about this mosque that was sort of the unusual. quote unquote city center mosque, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> which some people will definitely recognize, um, especially the people who are in the book. And oh, okay, know where right, it is. right, for um, sure. But it's, I think, unusually sort of ethnically mixed, and also unusually sort of um, trying to transcend, uh, you know, Sunni Shia. I mean, it's very sort of mm. diverse in its attendance. So, um, but anyway, yeah. So I sort of fell in with these young people. I think another advantage I had, aside from being a Muslim convert, which obviously isn't enough. I mean, you know, people share the same religious identity all the time and don't get along. So I think I bonded with these kids in part because actually an interest in music, which is the theme of the book, but also um, because I'd spent a lot of time working with young people. I went to grad school late in life. So between undergrad and grad school, I'd worked for 10 years in sort of youth programs in neighborhoods like this. So I think I could just sort of talk to kids like this and, you know, go to Burger King. And I gained a lot of weight, actually. During the <laughs> There's a lot of fast food. Um, that took place, but um, <clears throat> but yeah. So I think just uh, so yeah, I, and they were already sort of their own sort of group of friends, mm -hmm. and I sort of fell in with them over time. Um, and so yeah, but exactly that was the age so in the group. Th their parents would you would you sort of define them or characterize them as sort of blue collar? Uh, yeah, they mostly? were. They were so, and that also made them a little bit unusual because a lot of the uh, attendees of the mosque, which is I think more typical of Muslim Americans in some ways, yeah. although it's very diverse, is uh, more sort of. Um, engineers, lawyers, doctors, and we had those, but these guys were, their parents were like cab drivers, daycare workers, um, more that level. Got it. And they so. came and probably even immigrated here later, like That's maybe right. in the 70s or 80s, yeah. right, 80s or 90s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And some of them were actually born um, out of the country and then, so they were what do you call it? people call the 1.5 generation. <laughs> so they were, yeah, born, maybe grew up a couple years overseas and then but they were, you know, had been in America long, as long as they could, you know, sort of talk and. I mean, so I don't want to bury the lead because I mean, and you, and you mentioned this that again, what what you found, the the evidence that you found in the as you as you sort of followed the lives of these of these youth is that it, you know, and I'm going to quote here, contradicts the assumption and argues that there's nothing unusual about American Muslim, I'm sorry, Muslim American teenagers, seeming similar to other American teenagers. Right. right, because Muslim American teenagers are American teenagers already. Yeah, it's like which thank is, you for which thank is, you for saying that. Yeah, which is <laughs> I know <laughs> that's reflective of your experience growing it's up. Right. That's reflective of my experience growing up, and right. so it's. I think just going back to what you're saying, it's fascinating yeah. to be at the point yeah. where, you know, I'm glad that we have like here's the authoritative. <laughs> there you go. Here's the analysis. Right. To say that water is wet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, exactly. And I think somebody was telling me that, you know, in some ways, I'm glad to hear that it's, you know, you found it interesting, because I think the other thing that happens, people can read it and say, well, duh. I mean, <laughs> you know, and it is true, like, someone had this great phrase where it's like, it's explaining the Statue of Liberty to New Yorkers. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, we already, we already knew that. Um, but I that think, should be, the, like, the tagline of the book. Right? <laughs> but I think, I think the reality Muslim is... Muslim explains, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think the reality right. is that this is... Um, but it's interesting because yeah. even my own... I think what's really deep about it is that even my own experience of entering the mosque could be one of saying, hmm, I wonder if these people are going to be, like, strangely, powerfully religious. Or, you know, mm -hmm. you even can almost self stereotype you know what I mean I think for me of course that's being partly being new even then to the religion or different Muslim communities right. but I think even Muslims ourselves can sometimes say like oh well these other Muslims over here they're the really 
and of course there are crazy Muslims. I'm not saying that, yeah. but you know, like it's amazing how much um, these things can hold up, even right. when people have counter evidence that, oh yeah, I have this Muslim neighbor who's this, but I know that most of them are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So how do you sort of relentlessly just show this sort of regularness of? You know well, what I mean? well, I mean, this is the inherent problem of living in a mediated world yeah. where where everything is reductive, right? right? And so when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, just when we talk about like Black Lives Matter, for example, right? That's that's a, a, a movement that doesn't get the benefit of the overwhelming majority being people advocating for something that's pretty. Most people would agree with, which is stop killing black people, right? right. But you get like one crackpot who happens to have that tag, and oh, you know. So th- I mean, that's the reductive. That's that's the same framework that Muslims get lumped into, or that or that uh, you know. Latinos, or you, I mean, you name it, right? And it's not something that the broader, uh, homogeneous white population deals with in the same way, mm-hmm. right? So, and I'm I, glad that we have studies like this. I mean, mm-hmm. you know. well, I think also, you know, there's this. I, I wish I had the numbers on this, but there's this poll that happened after, you know, the Ground Zero Mosque controversy in New York, where they were going to sure. remember that the quote unquote Ground Zero Mosque, um, and, and that there was, was that was 2011, I think. Mm. 2010. Yeah. When, when was that? Like the park. Uh, was around the, park, around 50 time. Time. park. Park 51. 51. Yeah. yeah. And, and park I remember 51. this poll that said if you knew a Muslim person, you were more apt to support this idea. You know, if you knew anyone that was Muslim, your likelihood of supporting this project went up, you know, a long way. Whereas if you didn't. And so I think because also just numerically, Muslims are a small number of people yes. in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And if it's all mediated... And so you don't have any counter evidence to, you know, the crazy news coverage. It can be hard for people to have a sense that, like, oh, this is, you know, a teenager <laughs> you yeah. know, or a person right. or, That's right. That's you know, right. who is Muslim, you know, versus, like, this is a Muslim and that controls everything about how they think and how they act. And that's probably a weird, different thing. And, of course, we learn so little about it in school, right? Right. I mean, this is something well, that... Well, it's, it's, I mean, just what you're, what you're talking about, it, it gets, it's... It's you know this past weekend I was talking um, with with my former uh, communications teacher and who was and he was talking about forming in in a classroom mm-hmm. context where we're trying to get to know each other uh, you know the idea if we're talking about a hierarchy of, of dealing with people the ideal is at the very top human being mm-hmm. and then underneath that it's you know this religion or this nationality right. right and how so much of it is flipped yes so we start with you know jewish and then you know and and mm-hmm. so all those prejudices come, right and i i just thought this is my teacher is still teaching me after after this many years you know but but it it goes to the reductive framing right like mm-hmm. like like tamir rice that little boy in cleveland mm-hmm. right he's 12 years old he's shot on sight 12 mm-hmm. years old and yet we have Donald Trump Jr., who's like 39, and they're like, he's just a kid. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's <laughs> right, meeting right. with Russians, you know. And it's like, where, why? Because because to some extent, the narrative is that blackness is perceived first, and then all of the negative inferences that come with it. And I think Muslim to the same extent. Yeah. Right. A Muslim teenager is in a a, a demonstrably or visibly Muslim teenager is not given the benefit of the doubt no. in the same way. You know? Yeah, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, think, I mean, I think we, we went on a little bit of a tangent, but uh, a good one. A good tangent. No, a good one, a good one. Because, uh, we like those. But at Judge the same me. time, you know, I, I really would like to come... Yeah, I, I want get, to get into the book as well. It's interesting, One of because I think overall what, what, what you're talking about in the book, and, and, and pardon me if, if I'm being reductionist... Um, in the sense that, I mean, like, I was almost waiting for you to kind of get into, like, what W.E.B. Du Bois talks about with mm. regards to double consciousness. Yeah. Because essentially what you're doing is kind of looking at the the lives of these Muslim youth and the way that they're living contested lives, mm-hmm. right, as you, as, you, as you call it. And maybe I'll ask you to, or I would definitely add, would love for you to kind of comment on what you mean by contested lives. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, for, you know, rather than me kind of leading the question, just maybe mm-hmm. answering, like, how does that sort of lead to that idea of double consciousness that, that, that right. Du Bois talks about within the black American experience? Yeah, well, I think there's a similarity. I mean, obviously there's differences, and right. it's important to point out the differences in experience of groups, but um, but I think, you know, what I call culturally contested lies, mm-hmm. meaning that... So, as I should back up a little bit. So, as a sociologist who studies culture, one thing that's happened recently in sociology um, 
and the study of culture more broadly is that we're no longer understanding culture as sort of like a thing that like enters your head and controls everything you do. So it, it doesn't over, it doesn't sort of, and there, there are debates around this, but so, and of course it's not one thing, right? So there is no one Muslim culture. Right. There is no one white Midwestern culture. There is no one African American culture. Hmm. Um, and so that's one part. So there are different ways of doing it, but also it's not something that just controls you. So if, if I'm a Christian person, that doesn't mean that like the Bible is inside my head and everything I do is driven by what the Bible says, right? Even if I try to be like that, it's almost impossible to actually do it. And so Muslims aren't like that either. You know, no one is like that. So you have to sort of take apart the person from the culture a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean it can't be a powerful force, but I think as a sociologist, what you argue is that, you know, this all comes from people, right? Um, you can still be religious and think this, which I could talk about later if you want. Hmm. But these things really do come from people in terms of how they're enforced. So I can go yeah. to one mosque and hear one message about how I'm going to hell tomorrow if I don't this or that. I can go to another mosque, which is a whole different message. Yeah, it's still right. Islam, right. but it's an argument about it. And so I think for these kids, they're living between sort of the cultural expectation of what it means to be a Muslim in their community, right. which of course is specific right. versus if they lived in a village in Pakistan or a different part of the U.S. Hmm. And the expectation of what it means to be American teenager mm -hmm. in their schools, mm -hmm. which of course is a little bit localized as well. So some of these things, not all of them, are in tension with one another. And each chapter of the book sort of takes one of those sort of tension points. Thank you. And yeah. they won't really surprise anyone who's grown up in the milieu what they are. One is dating. Uh, one is listening to music that has profanity and other messages that might not be seen as acceptably Islamic. Uh, another is about sort of uh, prayer, but more more broadly sort of having obligations that are not what you might want to do at the time. Mm -hmm. So part of being a religious person, at least in Islam, is like you. there are things you're expected to do that are not what you might choose to do. And in some, time, some ways that's very un-American culture <laughs> to say mm. that, you know, this yeah. is, there's a larger mm. force besides what you feel like doing at the moment or what exactly you want in your hamburger, you know, <laughs> at that time. And then the fourth chapter is more about discrimination, which is less about this sort of, um, the, this tension, but also has some to it. So I think I just saw these kids, and again, it's not a tragedy. They mm. weren't miserable. In fact, they were not miserable. They were laughing a lot. They were joking a lot. Mm -hmm. They were happy, they, but they were trying to figure this out. Um, and they were really helping one another to do it, which I thought was very sort of sweet about it, that they were trying to figure out. They didn't want to just throw religion away. Mm -hmm. I think many people would say, oh, my God. I, and it's funny, you meet many people actually in my line of work because the only people that tend to study religion in sociology are people who have either been raised religious or no religion. They have some affinity with it. There's a mm -hmm. lot of people in the academy who don't really respect religion, I think, in a lot of ways, because mm -hmm. it's a very secular space. You're right. But what I was going to say is I think um, people are often thinking, oh, wow, I bet these kids can't get way to get, wait, get out of there. Yeah. Like, I, if you were raised, you know, Mormon, evangelical, Muslim, anything that people think of as conservative, right. well, they must be willing to just, they must be ready to just get out. Mm -hmm. But I think they weren't. I think they actually wanted to maintain this, mm -hmm. but they also wanted to be seen as cool right. and do fun things. Right. <laughs> so is that possible? I think it's possible, mm -hmm. but it takes some give on different sides of the equation, right? Mm -hmm. From parents, from religious leaders, and what are you defining as, of course, Islamically appropriate as part right. of it? So, for example, in the book, the, this mosque allowed them to play music sometimes and to, you know, in certain ways. And so I think it, it gave enough leeway that they weren't sort of felt like they were being rejected at every turn. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, they also still had to sort of figure out how to sort of do this in the right way. It's funny, yeah, I mean, because, again, growing up as a teenager with yeah. a love of music, I mean, maybe not the same music that, mm -hmm. that, that these teens were listening to, you know, my my own flavor was, you know, classic progressive rock. Yeah. But, you know, now it's hip hop. <clears throat> um, but you, you, you talk about this idea of Islamic listening. Is that yeah. what you call it yeah, in the book, yeah. Gary? Which is great. Cause, and so maybe talk a little bit about that because, it, you know, the way they're able to, again, navigate their love of hip hop, but yet kind of maintaining the kind of ethos of being a considered a righteous Muslim right. who doesn't listen to profanity or songs about you know, sex or drugs. Or right, yeah. So they would do a lot of this, um, you know, and this is the advantage of, so my study is very interactional, which means I would really spend all this time just sitting around with them and taking really detailed notes on small things they were doing that you might not recognize if you weren't doing that. And so one thing they would do a lot is, you know, if a song comes on with bad language, you like turn down that one part 
or if if there's a song that you like but you know it has bad words you you make a different version that's an islamic version of it sort of jokingly so the yeah. my one example is a song called uh sensual what's it called sensual seduction by Snoop Dogg they would call it like um Oh, now I'm forgetting. But like Quranic. I mean, they would put something like, so spiritual something, spiritual connection. <laughs> spiritual connection. <laughs> and so they would put in these words that were like, you know, and of course they're sort of making fun of that whole process, right? It's not yeah. like they would never, they've never heard a bad word or said a bad word. Right. But the point is, by sort of playing with this, it becomes less stressful. It's like, mm. this is like, these are words, these are, you know, this is sort of, you can make a game of this. And um, and it doesn't mean you believe less, and it doesn't mean you're a horrible person, and it also doesn't mean um, that you... The other thing that I think was important about music and hip-hop and for teenagers is that it's about looking like someone who's associated with these potentially cool things without actually doing any of the things, mm-hmm. right? So because so mm-hmm. music about you know, drugs, about alcohol, about... You know, you change the words, and the other kids know that you know the song, but it's not like you actually did that thing, which would have gone against your religion. Do you see what I'm saying? So no, yeah. it's like a mm-hmm. symbolic, like it's the importance of, of sort of symbolism. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of kids use hip hop this way from white suburban kids. I mean, it makes you feel cool to listen to it, but that doesn't mean you're going to go do the things in the song. Well, right? and, and I mean, I think I think it, that also illustrates the on what level we connect with music. Is it the lyrics or is it the tune? I mean, I would argue right. it's the tune first. Yeah. You know, no, I think it is, and in fact, there's mm-hmm. there's sociologists and music say this that that lyrics are not that. Now, of course, these guys listen to lyrics very closely, um, but but right, it's 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 much something much deeper than that. Yeah, I mean, because you know? when you don't know the lyrics, you still sing the song. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. I'm right. gonna uh huh uh, right. something something. You know. No, it's true. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. And, you know, there's ongoing debates, as you guys are probably familiar with, about the role of music in Islam and Muslim communities. And I think one thing that this mosque was trying to, to try to capture, because many religions have so much tradition with music, and try to capture the power of music in a way that can benefit that sense of community right. without falling into this, you know, right. the, the challenges. I mean, for me, I mean, growing up in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s, or coming of age in that, in that period, I mean, the... Unfortunately, the sort of normative Muslim communal response to Muslim community's response to music was uh, from the place of like, oh, it's haram, mm-hmm, it's, it's right. prohibited. Right. So then, you know, our way of quote unquote Islamic listening back yeah. when I was growing up was more like, well, I listen to music, but I don't listen to music that has profane words. Right. Or I listen to music, but I don't listen to music where that has a female vocalist because it was sure. a position that said, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, and as long as it's not a female singing. Right. Or I listen to music that's X, Y, right? Yeah. And yeah. so to me, I related very it's much. It's like finding loopholes. It is. Of, well, exactly. and, and, but yeah. it's very much kind of like, although not exactly the same as yeah. these youth are doing yeah. with, in the book with regards to Islamic listening, but we did our own version of that right. growing up. And so I related yeah. to that. And maybe, I don't know, I mean, you and your love of, of like film and pop culture I mean yeah. you're like well Lisa I, I watch movies but I don't watch you know I mean we're not seeing you know pornography being on the other end of the spectrum <laughs> sure but it's like even this like why well, I watch HBO but I want I don't watch Game of Thrones I mean, sure. that's not a hit against Game of Thrones I've never but, seen Game of Thrones yeah, yeah, yeah me so neither so I don't know but it. people love it and sure, you right. know but the, and, and I have people who literally tell me yeah we, we like fast forward the, like the bad scenes yeah sure, yeah, yeah. sure. exactly right? and that's what's interesting is like, even now I'm talking about 40 year old <laughs> people like, yeah. with, like adults like myself who right. have kids who are teenagers exactly sure. yeah and, and I think that's Islamic and, and viewing it really gets to, exactly and it gets to the use of technology that can allow that right like literally just fast forwarding mm. turning it down what do you do and also to feel like so true. that's okay to do that I mean it, it's basically like applying, and that's what I—that's what I talk about. It's like applying your sort of religious guidelines to this pop culture experience, and that actually makes the, in some ways, it makes your religion more real because you realize, oh, I can actually do this, and I feel like I'm being a good person, and I'm benefiting. Like, I don't want to not benefit from Game of Thrones because I'm Muslim. That's not really fair. Mm-hmm. Like, shouldn't don't I deserve? to both have that and this. Right. And the question, of course, is, right, is it a loophole? Is it a reinterpretation? Is it acceptable? Exactly. You know what I mean? Um, and I think we do it even beyond just whether it's, like, a, whether it's it, the way we consume culture uh, yeah. or consume aesthetics. It's also, yeah. you know, like, I remember, again, growing up with regards to dating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I knew people who had, you know, with some guys who had girlfriends, but it was mm-hmm. like, but we don't, we don't touch. We don't mm-hmm. kiss. We don't. Hmm. We're together, but we're not intimate. So right. 
it was again. Now you now Zucky, you you might characterize that as a loophole, but it's it. Or and, and just to, to be John's clear, point, I'm, I'm not. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm just judgment on anybody no, no, when no, I say the word loophole. Yeah, neither, I, I didn't mean to suggest that you were. I just think it's interesting way to think about it because it is. There's different ways saying. to. There's whether it's a reinterp- reinterpreting of dating within a Muslim context, or right. is it. A loophole. I mean, that's. I'm not here I mean, to comment I, on that. I look at yeah. I look yeah. at all this stuff, and I'm like, look, your life is your decisions, and if you're coming at a place where you can sort of make this stuff work, and and right. and you're, you know, I mean, ultimately, how people interface with religion is their own. It's a personal mm-hmm. de- definition or redefinition. So I'm yeah. I'm to be clear. I'm not. I'm not sitting here casting judgment on anybody. No, no, I know. Right, the right. last person to do that. But I do find that that because it varies from person to person. That's my point. Right. Yeah. Right? That's right. Because because you can have one person be like, well, I'm not even gonna. That's right. Watch Game of Thrones. I don't know yeah. why we're. I don't know why we're picking on Game of Thrones of all no, these. No, no, <laughs> just an example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and then uh, you know, I mean, I watch House of Cards and I want to take a shower afterwards. I mean, you know, <laughs> right. and that's for other reasons. <laughs> but, I think, yeah. but I think even having these debates is helpful because yeah. it, it lets you. Because I think sometimes what can happen is that people don't even talk about it at all. Like even talking about it. It becomes somehow, sort of like a, a taboo. And, right, uh, and definitely with this kind of stuff about... And I think this is happening more in communities of talking about dating, talking about things that... Right. Like, to not talk about it at all is just to make people assume like anything about it is horrible. That's right. Even bringing it up is sort of sinful. Sure, sure. But then you can't... But like, the reality is, guess what? People are hearing about it. People are thinking about it. People are faced with it. That's right. Um, and I think... And I'm not saying I have the answers to that, but I think... Um, you know, a, a, an example I use a lot is sort of in evangelical Christian communities. Like, there is a more of a history of like oh how you do this in an appropriate way or you know like there's books literally like going on a date with god or right? <laughs> there's literally like there's like a structure you know you know just to just to pick up on that and sort of tie into like pop culture for example yeah there's a thriving industry of evangelical targeted films exactly i just saw a trailer for one uh, the latest Kevin Sorbo. I was going to say you know, the guy who's playing vehicle. Hercules. Right? He's, yeah, he's in oh, like yeah. all of these things. I forget what <laughs> so it's funny. called. Yeah. But it's it's. We well, it used to be Kirk Cameron, right? No, it's, it's, yeah, no, right. <laughs> he's lost his luster. Yeah. So so and it, it's it's I, I call these you know they, it's the straw man franchise right? because it's yeah. always like virulent atheist guy who's just like who's who's yeah. who's, who's like so vehement to the point of like that's hilarious. Come on. He, he's you a know? caricature. Yeah, yeah and, that's and it, interesting. And it's all, like th- there's this one movie. It's called, <laughs> and I, I saw the trailer. To be fair, but I, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen the movie from the trailer. Yeah. But it's called God is Not Dead. And it's, I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's Kevin Sorbo as the professor, and he's the professor. That got a lot of press. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. It did. And he's like, you, in order to pass this class, you have to agree with me that God is dead. And one yeah. really determined, you know, uh, <laughs> plucky, plucky young <laughs> believer says, "I'm going to convince it." And I'm like. Come on. Like, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. Like, you're a professor, well, I'm a professor. Right, right. What what academic scenario does that happen? But not only that, and, and this is in the book as well, that I think the problem with those kind of things is that even the people they're targeted for are like, come on. Right? right? And so, so like, the, the kids in this book, their words, like, Islamic hip-hop, like, Native Dean and outlandish sure. groups. Talk and they, about that. Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. didn't, and now, I think they, they didn't love those groups. I thought they were okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think part of why they didn't love them is because adults were trying to push it on yeah. them exactly. as, like, right. a substitute. And right. if you're a teenager, that's, that's right. not going to work. Right. And so I think it's interesting because that comes, and I read a lot of stuff about evangelical music as well, but the problem with a lot of the research on that is it's it's rarely looking at as you'll appreciate, like the consumer side, like the reception. Right. Mm. So even a lot of evangelical kids, I think would be like, come on, buddy, life is more textured than this. <laughs> right. right. Even any, any, not even, but like any 14 year old, like they're not going to buy that. I doubt. Right. So, yeah. so the question is, we have to be more sophisticated and say like, you can be a religious person and engage with this world in a way that's actually, because part of why that doesn't work is that it doesn't let you be creative. Mm. Right. Like if I'm supposed to sit and like receive like a, hammer over the head movie about how I should be religious like that doesn't make me feel any sense of agency well, or engagement the, the, the very or, phrase preaching you know, to the choir right? yeah it exactly. assumes that you're already right bought and paid for so to speak and you're part of you know yeah and you know who, who's the audience beyond that mm-hmm. right and right. and and it it essentially because even within a specific religiously identifying group yeah. there's degrees of identification within that right Right. right. I mean, there's, exactly. there's nuance within. Well, and that's part of the point that I think people, and this is a bigger problem with the U.S., I think, that 
non-religious people don't really understand religious people that well, you know, including mm. <laughs> among white people. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, that's For one sure. of the biggest divides. There so is. to what extent do we, it doesn't mean you have to agree with everything, but res- like acknowledging the fact that there's diversity within these religions, yeah. there's different approaches, there's younger people wrestling with questions about sexuality, about all these things, and it's, I don't know, there's so much stereotyping, and like what well, you just said, that movie doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. Like, things like that, many religious leaders are the ones who are themselves painting these ridiculous black and white pictures of their own religion, which doesn't help anyone understand how well, it's complicated. And, and the flip side to that, this is something that, and Pervez, you probably know if you listen to the movie film, the movie film podcast with me and Brian Hall, we talk about the trope of the obnoxious religious guy. Exactly. In movies. Oh, yeah. And that's just shorthand, where one character will be like, well, you know, I prayed about it this morning. And you, reflexively, as the audience will be like, ooh, that guy, ooh, oh, you God, know? Yeah. Because that's the movie is like pointing a finger at that person, right? Exactly. And we see that going all the way back to MASH with, you know, Robert mm. Duvall as Frank Burns. And, you know, and it's, it's, so in others, there's this stark. There's where is the reasonable religious person? I don't care which religious person, but right. the idea of just being like, oh, and it's a thing, and that's fine. Well, and this gets back to your mediation thing because those people never get on the news, right? Yeah, like like they would always the mosque where mm-hmm. I work. They would say people say, oh, why don't you condemn? And like we put out a press release every single time anything happens, and it never gets on the news. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if Osama bin Laden puts on out one cassette tape. It's on every news that night. That's right. Well, you especially know, now, it would really be. Well, I, and it's <laughs> funny. You, you, well, not funny, but you make an interesting point in the introduction or the preface to the book where you talk about how, look, this book, I, I realize, you, know, you as the author are, 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 are saying, I realize this book doesn't look at the lives of African American, Black American, Muslim youth, or mm-hmm. Black American, Muslim community because they have their own very unique history. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a part of the reason why I think. Even when they get their mitigative, the, 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 the mitigate, the mediated, sorry, version of Islam, whether it's through the media or whatever, the 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 the, the part of the st- or uh, a story that isn't told is the Black American Muslim experience. Definitely, yeah. and that's well, it, well, and that's indicative of a larger absence of Black American voices within right. the media that's and right. within popular culture, or not popular. You know, you know what I mean, like mm-hmm. the, their representation. Um, and so I, I found that connection that you draw very. I mean, it's almost like a duh, like, okay, you know. Yeah, no, but it's true. Moment, but certainly I I do appreciate you calling attention to that. Yeah, no, that's really important. And there's great stuff. There's a book actually called Muslim Cool. I was going to say, before we move on or move beyond hip hop, we have to talk about Dr. Swad's book. Yeah. Who, I want to, full disclosure, she listens, her husband listens. Great, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and I'm really glad that you talk about her book. And in fact, one of my on my wish list is to have Dr. Swad on the show. Yeah, there you she's go. fantastic. Her work is Consider wonderful. this your invitation. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> no, that, that's a very, very important book and I encourage everyone to get that and read it. Um, and it's just so important to show uh, those connections. And I think what she does an amazing job of is showing the power of hip-hop music in bringing these different groups together uh, in, in ways that I don't know if anything else could have done it. And I think she also shows um, in much more depth, which I allude to, which is the history of, of course, Islam within hip hop. Mm, um, exactly. And which a is very crucial. rich. Oh, exactly. And beautiful history, which, and, again, one of my personal reasons of wanting to have Dr. Swat on the show is to sort of talk about that. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's and, and such a respectful, um, mm. respectful take on Islam from hip hop and vice versa and so I think uh, within that yeah so I think yeah I, you have to read her book she's amazing mm, thank you um, yeah. and so I guess uh, like I was saying I'm moving beyond or just talking about music and the way these youth interact with, with, with music in particular mm-hmm. um, maybe talk a little bit about um, their experiences with dating and, and mm-hmm. how do they I, I, didn't, I didn't I wasn't able to delve that much into yeah. that portion of the book so that was something that I knew was going to be an issue tricky oh, sorry <laughs> yeah, tricky, an issue yeah. but also yeah. tricky to even talk about mm. because of some of what we just said and that was probably because them, people have their shields up people have their shields up and people are no people are always worried about what other people are going to think about what they're doing and it's what you just said Zucky that the downside of everyone having their own take on it is that you don't know how someone's going to judge you mm. right so right. there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly people's parents and other people's parents. So mm-hmm. you probably know your own parents, what they're going to go for or not, maybe. But you don't know about other people's parents. You know what they're going to say about your parents and your family. <laughs> and so so much of it is about even reputation in the community. Right. What, what will people think? What will people think, right? Mm-hmm. Which we know is a classic second-generation immigrant 
thing. Oh, that transcends. That yeah. transcends. Well, yeah. I mean, Hassan Minaj made it like Lokya Gang, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he yeah. uses right. that exact oh, yeah. expression. That's true. To, yeah. And it beautifully kind that of universalizes. That was amazing. It really it, was. It's funny the timing was like that. Of course, Aziz Ansari, and yeah. then the big sick, and yeah. you know we can have criticisms of these things, and then it's just like something's happening right now. There but that that was amazing. It really was. His, but I think that that everyone's familiar with that idea, and yeah. so I think, but nonetheless, just like you said, different parents have different approaches, right? It's not there's not like the Quran tells you to do this, and so you do it. Like it's not even that clear in some ways. Um, but also there's of course cultural not just religious so where do people come from and who do they want you to marry and so there's all these mixing up messages but I think for these kids it was clear that um, this is something that people were doing in their high school this is something that they were interested in doing Hmm. and is there a way to do it that is somewhat Islamically appropriate or acceptable Um, the problem is there's no clear guidance on this so no one is going to sit down and say although eventually people in the mosque sort of tried that so I think I almost was there at a moment of and it may have happened with previous generations um, like mixers, halal, halal not, mixers. Not, no, 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 no. not even, but yeah. well, so this is the, this is the, right. Actually, one of, that would be a pretty progressive mosque. Exactly. <laughs> well, although it's funny you mention that because yeah. the thing about this mosque, which we'll also identify, it, unfortunately, is that they would have um, the youth program would be men and women together oh, in nice. the same room, and so I think from that, some people were already like, "Whoa, this mosque is out of control." You know, like isn't that, isn't that insane? I mean, hmm. you think about it. I mean, for I guess for I, I think especially in our listening audience who aren't Muslim, like there is a there is a, you know there are communities where having you know uh, 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 mixed gender youth gatherings is considered you know bleeding cutting edge. Yeah, and, and it still remains right. the case, man. I mean, sure. we're recording here at Talif. I mean, you know, a lot of our programming. You know, is accused of, or not accused, but the, 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 the notion is, well, like Talib is on the edge, and we're doing stuff that no one else is doing, and, and, and mm-hmm. you know, we're pushing the envelope. But it's really like, are we really? You know, if you really well, look at and, what's and out. There. I mean, you know, we had uh, Hind Mekki on in a previous episode yeah, talking about know. the side entrance of the mosque for, for the, the sisters section, mm-hmm. right. and sort of the the sort of uh, embarrassing state of many sister yeah. sections in mosques. So, I mean, clearly, right. this is this is a conversation that is ongoing, and and in, you can see why that leaf would be perceived as being cutting uh, out way, way out there out on there. the fringes, because, I yeah. mean, unfortunately, there's... Some things have been normalized that maybe should not be, you know, such right. as that. Good know. point, good point. Sorry. Right. Oh, no, no, and I, and, I, and, yeah, and I think, um, so for... But I guess, yeah. the, I think the, the sort of contradiction is that these parents, many of these parents... They want their kids to marry a Muslim person, hmm. and often that you would meet that person perhaps at the mosque, but then you also don't want them to be dating. You know what I mean? So this is okay. weird sort of tension. So, so I think hmm. um, this mosque had had sort of men and women together, um, which is part of why, admittedly, the kids like coming there because it was like, hey, this you know we can see people, we can meet people, um, but but they did there was no sense of like how to do this in an appropriate way no one sitting you down and saying here's how you because many people think just dating is haram itself um and i understand that argument but again people have various takes on it so it's very hard to know how to move forward when you have so many different messages and you're not sure how to do it so even within the group this is one place where i saw they use different approaches than one another so there was actually almost like a split in how people did it. One way was the way you said, which is what I call uh, keeping in halal, which is where the title of the book comes from, because they called it that, Hmm. which is sort of like, oh, I met this woman as a single woman. I like her, but we're not going to do anything. We're just going to, you know, spend time together. We're not going to, you know, and again, how well you can pull that off is a different issue. That's right. But that is the intention. I I do believe that was the honest intention. Um, And so there's that. The other way is what I call dating while Muslim, which is like you sort of... (laughs) You sort of hang out, but you don't... Dating almost. It's more like that we're all like, just like, don't tell anybody, basically. Uh, gotcha. But it's also, keep it very ambiguous. So how they would talk about it, even with their friends, mm. was so ambiguous that you could never be accused of doing something wrong because you never said it. But because you never said it, that also might mean you didn't do it. You see what I'm saying? So there was never. So there's this one conversation where they're sitting behind the mosque with this older kid, and everyone's always trying to be like the mentor. You know, right? Saying, hey guys, like, you know what the Quran says? Like, just don't do anything. Um, you know, you just can't do anything that the Quran says not to do, right? But that's so vague because no one says what that was. <laughs> like, there's no specifics because, of course, as soon as you talk about specifics, you're talking about things that are haram to talk about. So do you know what I mean? It's like it's this weird yeah. thing where, so um, so I sort of saw these two approaches now. Maybe ironically, the the dating while Muslim, the more secretive approach was more sort of successful, quote unquote, in the sense that 
you could sort of have these relationships and not get in trouble and not feel too guilty about it because you weren't trying to make it Islamic. But in essence, you're you're fracturing your own identity in doing that because you're you're right. you're living multiple lives. Well, that's the question, right? I, and I think there's different. I, I think it's a good point. I mean, I think what's interesting is they didn't feel that much like that, but I do think there's ways to do it. And maybe because they were with each other doing it. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, again, I don't even have... Like all this strength in numbers kind of thing. Sort of, or like or like this thing about like listening to music. If we're all doing this and we all feel like we're being good enough, maybe sure. this is okay. Now, sure. I'm, I'm not... And these kids weren't doing anything... I mean, to my knowledge, they weren't having sex. I mean, I, I don't think they were doing things that most people would say were a huge problem. Again, that's relative as well, right? Sure, of course. And so that gets to these hard conversations about what is Islamically appropriate. But mm-hmm. but that's beyond the scope of, of your... Yeah, you know. exactly. I'm not having a theological <laughs> right. debate about it, but I do think it's... The, but this is what's happening. So the question is, how do we deal with this, right? This could lead to feeling a fractured identity. It could lead to people being frustrated that like my religion has nothing to say about this thing that seems to be a crucial part of every other young mm. person I know's life and development. <laughs> mm. So that's going to make me feel like I'm pretty, you know, w- w- what do we do about that? Right. And you know, again, the mosque did acknowledge that and there was even points where they would say, "Okay, here's the guidelines." Like they would say like you can if you have the intention of marrying the person, if you, you talk, don't have you sex with them. them. Yeah. But again, you can always have the intention of marrying the person. <laughs> I mean, that's the beauty of the the niyat as sort of a that could be sort of a loophole. Like, well, I had the intention, but the, you know. Um, but anyway, and again, it's not to be cynical. So this is a real challenge. Like, I mean, look, I mean, how much are we bombarded with like romantic love, teenage love in music yeah. and movies? And so to say that that D- somehow Disney cartoons everything. from when you're in the cradle, practically exactly. You know, yeah. To say that that can have somehow be not my religion speaks to that none at all exactly. is very tart, especially if you do take your religion seriously. Right, so I think that's um, a real challenge. But I, but the, the, so so right, I think you're right. The, the this sort of secretive way is not a long term solution, but it's, I think in the current state, it's the one that in some ways worked the best because the other way of trying to do it in an appropriate way was very stressful uh, and very difficult because you felt mm-hmm. like you were constantly failing, even if you were, you know, because again, it's whose standards are you using? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, no. it's very complicated. Um, um, the mo- yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, and, and you, you. Well, you mentioned standards that we're using. Um, there was another part of the book that I want. I mean, I think kind of leads or uh, what we're talking about lends itself to this, and I'd love for you to comment on it. Um, you, you talk about how you know you identify three specific practices through which these group of youth sought to claim their elusive cultural middle ground. I'm quoting here: mm-hmm. Sym- symbolically encasing their Islamic activities in forms of discursive individualism. I found that fascinating. So you talk one is the way they demonstrated autonomy in religious action by exhibiting a measure of sort of control and, and mm-hmm. agency, right? Um, second is the way, and this is fascinating too, the boys strategically evoked the specter of an imagined, quote-unquote, extreme Muslim, mm-hmm. right? And then finally, they consistently talked about their fulfillment of locally normative religious action in language that emphasized the importance of their own agency. Mm-hmm. Again, kind of going back. So I'd love for you to kind of maybe flesh a little yeah. bit of that out. So this is, I think, the most sort of cultural sociology chapter of the book, which is where... It really is. There are these assumptions about what it means, I think, to be in a, a good uh, cultural American. And I think it's it's not just American. Well, because American culture is so widespread now that it's For other faith, places. Yeah. But it's almost like a relentless emphasis on making your own decisions right. by yourself. Yeah. Without your parents telling you, without God telling you, without your government telling you. And I think, hmm. and especially when you're a teenager, who's part of whose developmental job it is to become more independent, yeah. I think you really want to emphasize that. So if you have those expectations, but you're part of a community, and it doesn't have to be religious, it could be an immigrant cultural community, it could be any community that has its own sort of external expectations. Like, here's how you should act, here's how you should behave, here's things you should do, whether or not you want to do them. It can be hard to sort of reconcile those. Um, and I think, and it's interesting because I think one thing, and I, I my own personal experience of, of being a Muslim convert and marrying a Muslim, I think plays into this because I've had that own experience in my own life. So telling other people, particularly about converting, I, and I noticed how I would often frame it as like, oh, it was totally my decision. Mm. I wanted to do it. It was what I was like anyway. Now, those things aren't untrue, but the fact that there's nothing about my wife or how she felt a religious obligation would be ridiculous. Like, of course, that's part of it. They're huh. both there. Uh, but I would find right. myself downplaying that as I explained it to my 
with particularly not religious, more mainstream, maybe white American friends. Oh, okay. Do you see yeah, why, why, though? Yeah. I think, I don't know why. So this is where, like, sociology comes in. I think because I thought it would be more acceptable if I said mm. it that way. So I think there's a sense mm. that... To, to make it... More individual, like it, it's you, you, it's, you, your own will, so yeah, to speak. As opposed, to, yeah, right. but, so, but so this you, is what I mean by cultural. Efficiency. But is that framing different when you were talking to, say, a Muslim interlocutor? You know what I mean? Uh, Who's asking about your conversion story? Yeah, maybe not. So yeah. I, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe yeah. not. But but, I, but in yeah. essence, you're saying you sort of leave to the side this idea of that there are multiple external factors in addition to yeah. um, your own internal right. motivation. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Like, well, Osama is a fan of saying Osama Cannon. Like yeah. you know, the conversion is never an event; it's a process. Oh, yeah, so yeah, we're yeah. not we're talking about a culmination of. Oh, Oh, yeah, and, and, and I and I think that gets back to the com- individuals, right? I think right. it gets back to the complexity thing that is often missing from this. Yeah, like, there you go. But but I do think that I think my point here, sort of in this, which speaks to this sociology of sort of American culture, is that there's a relentless emphasis on individualism. That's right. I don't want the government telling me what to do. I don't want my neighbor telling me what to do. Mm. I don't want my tax. I'm going to do what mm-hmm. I want. Uh, and again, most people don't actually live that way, and you can't, <laughs> right? That's it's right. like Obama's thing about like. You were helped. Whatever the thing was, like that we helped you build that. The government helped you. Didn't build that. Oh, you didn't, oh yeah. my god! Oh Remember my that? god! Remember that but, became like the convention slogan. But, but that's yeah. why those things cause so much uproar because yeah. the idea that anyone would have acknowledged like assistance from someone else. Yeah, it's I, sort mean, of like I mean, I mean, American, right? If, you know? if rugged individualism is sort of like the American right. bumper sticker, then right. then anything that that would in any way negate that or or ding that is perceived right. as some great wrong. Yeah. Right? Even though it's it's an actuality in any sense. That's how it is. You know? Yeah. Well from and the perspective of these youth yeah. and I found and you again talk about this earlier in the in the book, but for the Muslim youth there's no they don't see any inherent conflict between their American culture and their Muslim culture. No. But rather it's the community, the parents, the leadership yeah. maybe Religious leadership that's telling them otherwise, right? I mean, I think there so it is, goes against that sort of hey, uh, that takes agency away from me and my own individualism and my own free right. will and and right. I think autonomy. That's, well, and I think that's the challenge, too, especially when talking about young people, because of course part of the job of adults is to try to guide them in the right way. Right. So you can't without obviously, being authorita- authoritarian. Exactly, you can't obviously let them do whatever they want. That's not going to work. But I think to give them some sense of they can help figure out how to do this. And I think these kids were already sort of, in some ways, by default. I mean, they didn't... Two of them um, had fathers that weren't really around. You know, like, they they were sort of on their own a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you could really see them having these sort of... Trying to work this out in a very, I think, sincere way. Um, Something that wasn't that easy. Um, But getting back to... I'm trying to figure out what what was the part of the question that you asked originally we always have these good, good tangents I like that as, as, as a tag well I read the portion about how they <laughs> oh yeah sorry yeah the yeah, individual so I think like right. prayer I think strikes me as something that oh, is yeah. in we'll a very a in that. a very day to day way can pull against this sense of like well I can do whatever I want it's like no this is the Quran's pretty clear <laughs> repeatedly <laughs> like this is an expectation which I think it's why Muslims often struggle with it and there's often how do you get yourself to want to how do you there's all these sort of things about how do you but I yeah. think for these kids what I saw them do was sort of try to like delay it do it a little bit later but they would always do it but it was like how do I make this feel like getting it's, back to my thing about my own conversion to make it feel like it's or look to other people like it's coming from me mm-hmm. right even when and what I'm saying is people twist themselves around just not to have to do with the fact that, like, no, this is actually something that you have to do. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so to accept that there are things that you have to do, I mean, mm. Islam means submission. I'm not saying it's all, like, it's all intense, but it is, that's part of it. And I think that's right. a very un-American, un-mainstream. I think there are many religious people on the right who would actually agree with some of the, what I'm saying. That's what's interesting. I think this is a real cultural divide. It in America, really is. Like, yeah. To give up to a greater good of the community, a greater religious good, something that's outside of yourself and your own success and achievement is not very American in a lot of ways. Um, mm. Although people would say maybe they do that for the for the nation or for the army or something, do you know what I mean? But right. To do that, they just replace one for the other. Yeah. Uh, but I know what I found interesting is like you mentioned prayer times, like the, you know you talk about in the book, like the adhan would be called the call for prayer for Dhuhr, for example, and they yeah. would, they wouldn't pray right away, or they would they they would delay it, but right. they would pray still. Yeah. It's, they're still observing the prayer. Right. They're just not praying when they're expected to, I guess. Right. But. That expectation, I mean, as we all know, I mean, within even, like, I mean, 
like Dohar comes in at a certain time, but you technically have till Usr to pray. That's right. Although there is an expectation to pray, you know, as quick early as possible and all of that stuff. So right. even there, it's kind of like not so much a loophole as right. more of what you're saying, which is, hey, I still have autonomy. Like I'll pray when I want to pray. Right. I'll pray, right. but I just won't pray when you tell me to pray. Sure. But I think part of why they feel yeah. the need to do that is yeah. going back to your point about the trope of the obnoxious religious person. That's what I wanted yeah. to ask. Why they don't want to look like. They're mindless. I think this is the problem that religion, as it's often cast in America, oh, yeah. is is about like you're just a mindless follower of this crazy supernatural thing, and you go yeah. around. And hardly anyone is actually like that. Like but there's an idea that people are like Bill that. Bill Maher, so you don't, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so you don't want to look like that. Mm-hmm. You don't want to seem mm-hmm. like. And, and this extreme Muslim thing is. I meant to bring it up before because it's exactly your thing of the obnoxious religious person. They would always have this little character of like we've all done this like sisters and you know like they would do this like deep accent and it's hilarious (laughs) exactly and so in some ways that's us doing the obnoxious religious person yeah and my argument in the book as a way of separate like that's not me that's me that's That's that guy that's exactly it and that guy may not even really exist oh the specter of the extreme Muslims we talk about right and so it's a way of saying and again I don't blame them for that like you have to do it Mm. because you're so worried about that being put onto you you're or right. what if you're turning into that because you're religious right which has I guess I think there's just not much room for like you said the reasonable religious person where is that person yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? mm-hmm. and I think why people come to places like Talif or even this mosque is that there are people who they can see are being religious in that way and they want to be able to do that right do you know what I mean right absolutely um, um, I think that um, I mean you know we can keep talking and I'd love to just talk <laughs> hours but I mean yeah. you know, for the sake of time there is another. So, the, in, in the in the latter chapters, you talk about their experiences, but focusing specifically on how they relate to the the great the broader society mm-hmm. and how they exert their Islamic identity yeah. um, with their non-Muslim peers. Right. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about that, and then sure. I'd love for you to comment on a couple of things, and then we'll. I think we'll, we can we'll, wrap we'll, things up. We'll wrap things up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think the the discrimination chapter, like I said, I think that was something that. I expect to be more the forefront. It wasn't there. And it's important to know that to them, that can be another way of stereotyping them as like, they're always suffering the burden of Islamophobia. You know, it's like, it's another Mm. weird way of like flattening people Mm. because I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, but I'm saying like, it's not, it's, it's, it's not their main thing. (laughs) Right. And so to be a victim. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what we're talking about before, but boiling people down to like having somebody represented solely by their blackness or their, or their Catholicism. Reductive. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So I think to defining people. Exactly. And so I think to them, and there's a great, there's a part of the book where they, they make a movie about Islamophobia at the mosque and they show the movie, um, at, at this event and the kids are like, and, and then they showed it at another event, and the kids are like, are they going to show that movie? I hate that movie because I look like <laughs> such a punk. Because they literally have one of the kids, like, they have slow motion, and he's, like, looking down, like, as a set. <laughs> and he's like, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. And also, not surprisingly, they literally edit out of the movie times when the kids would say, oh, I, I hit that guy back. Or oh. I said this back to him. So there's a real tension wow. in, in the mosque. So, so in other words, the, the mosque, yeah. through this film, is sort of furthering the victimization. The victimization. Well, I call it like vulnerable, sort of a vulnerable nobility. So like, there you go. It's like, That's even better. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. You want to be, be the, the noble, suffering... Yeah. And I, again, suffering I'm, in I'm silence. Not, yeah, I'm yes. not blaming these people because they're doing their best, but it is true that it, it made them feel no sense of power. And again, I'm not saying you should fight back, but it was they were sort of like... This is in, in my school. If I don't do something back, I'm, they're going to keep doing that. It's not going to work for me to be like, let me teach you about how Islam is a religion of peace. It just doesn't work for their context. We've seen the Karate Kid. We know how this goes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so I think that yeah. kind of so that's part of the discrimination story. Is that mm. and also I should mention it's very important. And speaking of of other kinds of Muslims, obviously I don't c- talk about the young women there. Um, oh yeah, you know right, people right, who right. are visibly marked as Muslim. These kids weren't really that. I mean, their names did. But sure. they, they could look like an African American kid, a Latina. They were often taken for a Latina, the Jordanian kids, and they would, they knew Spanish quite well because of that. But sure. but you know, so so they didn't they didn't. If you don't mind, we're I mean, I, the job. Yeah. I, I meant to kind of talk about or ask you about this in the intro. Is that yeah. the book deliberately? Not well, I don't know about deliberately, but yeah. but, but is unabashed in the sense that look, I am talking about Muslim 
men here, yeah. Muslim young boys. Yeah. Um, was that a conscious decision on your part? Or, and if it was, or if it was not even, yeah. what were some of the difficulties that you found if you did want to incorporate Muslim female uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, No, this is a really important well. part of it. I mean, I think a lot of people who do these kind of studies, and it's actually getting criticized more, which is a good thing, that many ethnographies end up being about mm. men because men have traditionally done this. Now, luckily, there's more women. And part of this is how the field is set up, and it's a whole separate thing. But anyway, um, but I think for me, it, it was difficult to incorporate young women because of, even though it was a mixed group in the mosque, mm-hmm. they were still socially segregated by gender, which mm-hmm. also is what most kids at that age are like, regardless of religion. religion right. <laughs> so, yeah, right. so there was just a group of guy friends, and that's who I sort of fell in with. Now, I did get to know some of the women that they knew both as friends and potential romantic partners, and some of them are in the book and some of them aren't. Um, and some of the ones that aren't, aren't because... I had to ask permission of everyone to, for their oh, and course. their parents, and so there's actually one particular person who is not in the book because this young woman's parents said, like, we don't want her to be in this because of mm-hmm. some of this stuff with dating, and so I totally respected that. I was fine to do it. Um, but I think there's just a lot of, as we all probably know, there's a lot of concern and I think sometimes undue attention on sort of like women as holders of the reputation of the family and mm. all this kind of stuff. So I think that made it more high stakes for women to be in something like this. Right. Um, and so with, but I think that will still happen over time. And there is a great actually book called All American Yemeni Girls, which is about these Yemeni girls in this school in 1990s this woman did a study which is really great and gets at a lot of this stuff so that's what I would suggest for people looking for something about young Muslim women right. but I think inshallah there'll be more things like that mm. um, as there's more and also it's exciting because you're seeing more more people of color more women more Muslims in these fields, in these fields where they can yeah. actually do this research which makes more likely to make it happen so that's right that's anyway right. I hope that answered the question. No, no <laughs> well, and, yeah. and, and hey, maybe maybe a, a sequel. Book. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Well, Focusing before we get exactly. to the sequel, I mean, the book hasn't even come out yet. So, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm being very, I'm, I'm very confident it'll be. Kind no, of, no, I'm not. I'm not seeing it on. I just want you to. Do I'm, I'm seeing a whole franchise, a, a shared universe, or a sort thing. of George Lucas prequel. There you go. Oh lord, <laughs> which everyone no. will hate. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah. you heard the Patton Oswalt thing about that? Uh, where if he could go back yeah, in time. Exactly. I think he said, I, I, I would care I would, about the things, where these things come from. <laughs> that's right, that's right. He said, I just want the thing I like the way I, exactly. I, I like it. Exactly. Don't show me oh, how. I'm doing, oh, I'm doing this. Yeah, do you like ice cream? Here's he meets like, him in an elevator. Yeah, exactly. He's meeting in an elevator and he's like, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to do, my, like, my next movie is going to explore the young Darth Vader. And right. when it came to me, it's like, oh, this, that's a cool idea. And he's like, well, and, I mean, but then he's like, the, it turns the, into the, like, the like, genius yeah. of that bit is it gets to <laughs> he's this, sad. this broader. <laughs> he's <laughs> sad. He's he's sad. Mom, what happens in the movie? Oh, his mom dies and he's sad. Yeah, I mean, does he have a sword and all this stuff? Well, it's, I mean, <laughs> the, the genius of, of that routine is it gets yeah. to a broader thing about why we feel the need to yeah. delve into, like, you know, Hannibal Lecter. Do we really need to see why he became a cannibal? Because the right. terror is purely from not knowing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Aliens franchise. Or, or ali- the Alien what, franchise what, what, is a great example. Scott the most himself recent is doing. Yeah. I actually yeah. like Covenant more than you, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh man, <laughs> that's... Sorry. Talk about a tangent. <laughs> I know, talk about a tangent. Right. No, no, sorry. So what yeah. I wanted to do was I wanted to give you time to kind of talk about the, like the books coming out yeah. what's on the horizon in terms of that the launch yeah. um, you know what can our listeners and, and, and what can we do to help that please yeah, yeah. Um, so I put up thank you saying. yes I knew to this <laughs> I feel very proud by the way that we are the first media outlet that John is oh, talking to you are and yes from here to greater things hopefully exactly. hopefully <laughs> you, you gotta start somewhere Trevor Noah next yeah that's right you <laughs> get, the, get the low hanging fruit out of the way first <laughs> this is a Trevor Noah stepping stone basically <laughs> Um, we usually are. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I'm sort of new to this part of it, and a lot yeah. of academics are, and I think this is a. I'm I'm fortunate that the timing is such that people are interested, and so um, yeah, I'm going back to Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope to be back for you know next year for a few appearances. I, I don't have anything lined up yet, um, but there's a lot of uh, blogs that are covering it. It got a really good review in this place called Forward Reviews. It's going to be its book of the week next week. Um, so yeah, I'll keep you guys posted. But so far, um, and what if people yeah. who are listening to the show would like to get in touch with you to maybe have a, like to host like a book signing and a, yeah, yeah definitely and is that, are you open to things like that? oh I love it yeah that's what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping to do exactly and definitely tap into the uh, different American Muslim communities for that 
because that's one of the audience that I really want to benefit from this. Um, so, yeah, so I can be reached through, you know, NYU Abu Dhabi is where I work. You can find me there. Um, it's also the books available on Amazon uh, already for pre-order. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, I guess that's... Are you, are you on social media or anything like that? Uh, I am. <laughs> this is something else I have to do. I am not on Twitter or Instagram, so th- I need to uh, probably do that. Um, so, yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay, great. And, and so, I mean, before you leave, I want to yeah. ask you, as a sociologist, so, like, our show our, our, is Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. Yeah, I like the name a lot. Well, thank you. No, thank you. But... In the book, you use the expression Muslim American. I mean, yeah. as a sociologist, could you just comment on that and maybe put to rest this debate if there is one in the <laughs> There's Muslim a debate? Maybe. I don't know if there is one. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm just making it up. There's a debate in right. my mind, okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, I believe you. I mean, is the correct uh, right. appellate, you know, appellate, is, yeah. it, is it, is it, is it, Muslim is it American, American Muslim? Muslim? Yeah. Or, right. or, okay. Yeah, because are we wrong? Or is like it? Some would say you right. should just say American. Some would say you just say Muslim. I mean, forget those Look people. At right? I'm just being like, <laughs> like, let's be real. Like, why yeah. you as a sociologist mm-hmm. use the term Muslim American? I don't yeah. think that's by accident. No, it's not. So, so you accident. said Muslim American in the book. I did, and then we said we say American. We Muslim. say American. Muslim. So it's a throwdown. It's. A, I, never I know. I was, it's a polarizing. We should be you playing the Mortal Kombat point. There you go. Exactly. I didn't know we were leading up to this. This is all a build up. We're in Thunderdome. The controversy. No, I think it's a good question, and actually. I have a little bit of a maybe a sort of um, loophole, which is that I use the term because the people on my site use the term that mm. way. So, okay. so Muslim American was what they said, uh, uh, what okay. the kids said, what the for the most part. Got so it. I sort of adopted it for that. I think people like that because it sort of um, it, it sort of parallels, you know, other constructions, African American, Latino American. So I think it sort of puts you as part of sort of a. And sub- I think that really has kind of become the the, the de facto Muslim kind of American that people use. On yeah, the other I think hand, we're a little right. On the other hand, we are I, swimming against the stream a little. Well, no, but I let me say yeah. let me say this. On the other Please. hand, there was debates in the mosque about this. So mm. so this is a live sort oh, yeah. of ongoing thing where some people would say, for the reasons many people say, oh, it's you know you're. You're sort of coming up, you know. You're sort of more American if you say American Muslim, you know. So, but I think it's as a sociologist, what you want to say is what difference does it actually make in the actual world? Because I think you. one problem with these things is sometimes we think they mean we, a lot. We assign it more importance. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or you'd have to study. That would be its own study. Like, wh- how, how does it make a difference? Like, you mm-hmm. can poll people. When you call it that, does it make you think of them? Maybe it doesn't it, matter. It, there you go. You know? Exactly. So, but I... But I wasn't being facetious when I said there's a debate. I mean, there actually yeah, is a debate. I believe you. I just... Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'm kind of... I'm genuinely asking that question, like, well, right. what substantial difference is it making? I mean, right. to, to me, like, as we're in the process of us having this conversation in the last... 60 seconds I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about why did we decide what we did and I, I think it just rolled off better it just sounded it, for better. me it rolled off better that's what it was okay. you had so a deadline for the title <laughs> there you go <laughs> we were under the gun yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think you you, you, you you raise I think an interesting point about like maybe like poll you know ask people like when you hear the term Muslim American versus American Muslim right. what do they think about what messages is that See, I, you know, right. to, to me I, I draw a distinction be- because to me it's not it's not a hyphenate like an ethnicity. It's not African American. Hmm. It's it's like to me. I don't uh, say Jewish American. I say oh, it's a it's right. an American Jew. It's an That's American true. Muslim. Well, and American. then that gets to the question of is which is a whole other field in sociology is, yeah. is are Muslims getting racialized to the point where they're thought of as a group mm. in a way that other religious groups are not right. currently, although at the time they were. So sure. if you look at Catholics, sure. they were seen as like one ethnic group or Jews, right? right or Jews. So that's another. Fascinating, and it's interesting because yeah. you, you went there. Because the second question I wanted to ask, and as we kind of wrap, yeah. because I have you here, is again as a, as a sociologist, um, and this is again a debate. I don't, and I'm not just saying this facetiously either. Is in terms of like, does culture, like, does religion fit under the rubric of culture, or mm-hmm. does culture fit under the rubric of religion? Ooh, right. Wow. Yeah. I think it's um, because I know Muslims I, would I like would it. Say, I think oftentimes Muslims make the argument, and I think right. incorrectly so, that religion informs culture, and it's right. religion that is the uh, the whatever you would call it, the right. outer yeah, shell. I would argue the reverse, personally. Yeah, I think religion. I think culture encom- is far broader, and 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 culture has many slices of which religion is one. Correct. That's mm. me. I don't know. What do you think? But I would, yeah, I would, wow. I would ask, ask an expert. <laughs> this is really the... I mean, I think it... I mean, this is going to be annoying, too, but I think it also depends on on the context. And, and mm. I think 
people, I think definitely, well, what we see with Islam, right? I mean, this is something that comes up a lot. I teach a, uh, basically a sociology of Islam class, and what we start with the question, the class is, what is Islam, right? Um, mm. Is it a culture? Is it a religion? Is it a, and so one of the things is that, of course, Islam, there is a common, what someone would call a common grammar. Like, every Muslim, there are certain things that at least you know about, even if you're arguing about them, there's something that you're referring to, right? Mm. On the other hand, if you look around the world, like, the cultural prism through which Islam has been interpreted and looks differently is so dizzyingly diverse mm. that I think there is. So I think in some ways it's more, this is going to be annoying sort of ethnographic answer that it sort of depends what the people are trying to do, mm. which one they're trying to emphasize. Yeah. Mm. So for example, with, there's a lot of research and this is, I think what you're referring to also that in the current generation, there's this thing about, Oh, culture has sort of, taken Islam away from its true, pure, That's whatever. What I mean. right. But the problem is that assumes that there is like a pure, because even in, I would argue, even in the original days of the Prophet, there, sure. was, there was a cultural influence. That's of, what I'm I mean, talking about. Arabic exactly. and the landscape and the marketplace. To not think you know, that 7th century Arabia informed, you know, much of, or a, a, a good sizable chunk of early Muslim practice, right. uh, appropriating of certain things, norms. You're fooling yourselves. I mean, you're, right, you're looking right. at Islam, you know, outside of its. I mean, it doesn't context. exist in a vacuum. It doesn't it's exist right. in a vacuum. I think uh, I feel like it was Doctor Omar Farouk Abdullah who said it takes the shape of the vessel it's poured into. Mm. Yeah, he did. Right but I think the people show. then, of course, argue. I think people use that strategically often to say things like, "Well, this thing about women being separate is not religion; it's culture." Mm. So people use that as a way to sort of. In, in, in debates, I think that's where it comes up more. Yeah. That's like, what I, I, I want to convince you that yeah. this is cultural because what that means, and I'm appealing to this only works if you really believe that Islam is more important, which has religious Muslim, I'm assuming you do, that you'll say, oh, okay, we can leave that cultural we thing can behind. Put that aside. Yeah. Um, so it's a way of putting down that other part of it. It is. So and it's uh, like a strategic I would, argument. I think though. you're being nice. I would even say it's a cop out, because like, you're not mm-hmm. really dealing with then the elephant in the room or the real issue by mm-hmm. saying, well, yeah, women are mistreated, but those that, that, that's, that's cultural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right. not religious. Yeah. Right. And, and it, to me, it's almost a <laughs> As if it would be better if it was religious. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that mistreatment of women is religious. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, misogyny is in the text. So, you know, no, no. I right, mean, right, exactly. Right. That's, but I think, I mean, yeah. the reason why people police is like Talif and also the the mosque where I did this thing where they they were having Quran classes that would attend and and they would they would really emphasize these kind of debates right mm-hmm. that is what has to be happening right mm-hmm. now they would say mm-hmm. like the Quran itself says interrogate ask questions mm-hmm. of it and I think that's the kind of thing that's exciting right now is that right. I think there's almost nothing more revolutionary than having these communities where people are actually that's so debating true I mean things, I think I, yeah to, to a certain extent I take things like that for granted but you're right I mean you know that wasn't always happening and that wasn't always the case the yeah. fact that we are having these, you know, again, people are, you know, it, it's it's in a Quran study class where they're asking those kind of questions or at least attempting to yeah. address them. That is unique because we didn't have that growing up. I didn't have that growing up. Sorry. Well, I mean, I, I hope that your book will be a vehicle that yeah. furthers these kinds of conversations both within and without the Muslim community right. because uh, I think... I'm just ecstatic to have stuff like this out there, and it's part of the "quote unquote" mainstream conversation. Uh, I think it's essential. I think it, it's it's important, and certainly as a as a communication scholar, I I know that I will be drawing on it for intercultural classes that I teach. So it's Great. yeah, John. I mean, again, to your faith, it's a fascinating book. I mean, the little I've been able to delve into it, and and I mean, we you know, you're, you're not the first person we've had on the show who. Who's got either a book forthcoming or has just the first one that we've liked? (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I swear. I'm kidding. Awkward. Sorry, Zarina. Sorry, (laughs) Shadi Hamid. Sorry, you know, Miraj Mohyuddin. (laughs) I could just go keep going on. Emails go out. Yeah, emails go out. Right. (laughs) Suddenly, I'm not on the next episode. We have to disclaim the views of Zaki Hassan. (laughs) Suddenly, Parvez is the solo host. (laughs) Exactly. But uh, no, thank you. No, really, John. And again, for our listeners, the book comes out September fifth. But you can order it right now on. On Amazon and, yeah. and anyone listening to the show, please go and do that. And uh, it's called Keeping It Halal, and, and uh, y- y- you're going to love it. And I think, especially for people of my ilk and just people who grew up, you know, um, uh, you know, as second generation American Muslims, uh, you know, um, will find so much to relate to in the book. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. And uh, so, for uh, if you have comments, questions, feedback, please do. Uh, send us an email on diffu- at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can visit us on our Facebook page, leave comments, questions, 
Facebook.com dot com slash diffuse congruence. Zucky has is much more active on Twitter and social media than I am, so I'll leave it to you to Yeah, you can find me uh, on, on Twitter at Zucky's Corner, Z A K I S Corner. It's also my website, just added dot com. That's also my Instagram. And uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, for, for those, and I've said it before, Zucky does, what, 800 other podcasts, mm-hmm. but... Uh, I do a few. I'm, I'm going to be launching a new one, actually, in just a few weeks. Good so. God. Okay. Yeah. Although I'm going to be just, just a, I'm gonna, a, another uh, another voice. I'm going to work with your wife, and we're going to do an intervention, and we're going to... Well, my wife says that away she from needs pie. to do a podcast with me to talk to me. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's not yeah. a bad idea. That's yeah. the end. Not a good sign, but not a bad idea either. <laughs> Both. Both. That's what my kids say. They're like, Daddy, can we, can we podcast with you so we can see you? Oh, I'm man. like, quiet. I'm on a show right now. That's hilarious. Lock the door behind No, but the reason I brought it, it up was because, because one, of the, right. one of the great things you know Zucky's been number. doing... You know, one of the great things that Zucky's been doing on his uh, movie film podcast is they do these great commentaries. In fact, you, I'm sorry, even on your, on your Nostalgia, Nostalgia Theater, theater yeah. where yeah. you and your, par- and, your, and your co-host, you know... Do we, a commentary we, we, we track to a, a movie. Film. We watch a right. film together and we talk yeah. through it. So I was like, well, there's not a lot out they there, but I would love to do that for this show. So I'm just teasing that. Oh, that okay. In, you know, in, in the, inshallah, God willing. <laughs> we're we're going to watch God is Not Dead starring Kevin Sorbo. That's going to be our first commentary. <laughs> oh, I thought you would have a commentary track about this show. That we, would be, <laughs> that's a super meta. Kind of a, we had super meta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the part where we said this. Oh. <laughs> that was good. I got a good joke coming up. Uh, Although that's harder that's with good. audio, I bet. I know. It's, it's just noise. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. <laughs> it's overlap. We do it, and then we afterwards we're like, yeah, yeah. we didn't think that but through. I want to say one more thing, just, yeah, to, please. just to give Zucky a, more props, because yeah. I really think what you do in terms of pop culture is so important for connecting with different kinds of people oh, yeah. of different backgrounds, and I think it's one of the most successful things that can do that. Like, we're talking about music. There's a reason why music's in the book. I think mm-hmm. I went down this road because I took a pop culture class uh, in my first year of undergrad, and that made me realize how much, so much of what people do in their everyday life is interact oh, at the yeah. level of pop culture, and it really cuts across so many lines and so I think yeah, I just right. want to say what you do is great for that reason and not like that's why you're doing it but it's just like this is what people really care about right, they care about right. Star Trek they care about you yeah, know absolutely viciously and care about it one yeah, of our conscious know. attempts is, is is to have guests on the show who are out there as cultural producers yeah so we've oh, had yeah. comedians we've had artists we've totally. had uh, you know musicians and, and, and we want to continue doing that yeah, because great. I think we need or to even uh, to, to showcase or highlight Muslims who are out there in the creative space actually being content providers, content creators, sorry, is so important, as well as people like yourself who are studying it. So, And I think the way you handle your sort of identity and when you do that is just beautiful because it's there. Oh, it's almost like they, the, the kids, like I call it low-key Islam. Low-key Islam. Book. I don't right. know if that's what you do, but it's like it's there, but it's not like it's all about that, right? But you're yeah. also happy to talk about it and I think yeah. it's just a great and you could write something probably just about that I don't know how conscious it is but I think it's just a, it's just really nice well thank you no I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it was you know uh, during uh, you just you mentioned uh, on my other show we did a Raiders of the Lost Ark commentary yeah and uh, that was very interesting because I uh, you listened to that right yeah uh, J- John Rice Davies <laughs> as Sala you know the Sala character the yeah. who helps Indiana Jones in, right. in Egypt and Cairo and, yeah. and, 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 and get the art bad dates and wa- bad dates right yeah. and yeah. watching that film while doing this analysis you know that, that was when it occurred to me how this is in, the, in 1980 you have a character who's Indiana Jones is equal he's mm. not he's not a comedic character he's not a, a, a villain he's right. you know that was kind of a big deal back then you know oh, yeah. and, well, I, what I found fascinating is while you were talking about the character and responding to it the way you are right now, you also talk about the actor. Yeah, and how the more... actor is like the biggest Islamophobe in oh, England. Bummer. Yeah, 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 interesting. And has said, and, but no, but you kind of process that um, while did. you're talking yeah. about it. That notwithstanding the sort of like the direction the actor has taken, yeah, vis-a-vis his views on Islam, huh. here's a portrayal of a wonderful character. To I mean, yeah, I mean, especially in Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's right. not. He's not, you know, he he speaks eloquently. He dresses sharply. I mean, he's yeah. not the 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 funny sidekick character. And, you know, they originally wanted Danny DeVito to play that role, and you can imagine that the way that would have gone. That's but right. I mean, that was a conscious decision. And mm-hmm. I thought, man, when you when you look at that contextually, 1980, right. that was slim pickings back then. Absolutely. You know? I mean, a much more a much more recent film and much later film is like say, take something like The Mummy. 
yeah, the, exactly. right? In which Where you have all these Muslim and Arab uh, played characters. by by uh, by Arab actors, and they're just and they're caricatures. they're yeah, you know, they're bumbling so, idiots, or they're or they're conniving. Uh, yeah. villains literally like mustache twirling you know? yeah but but you know <laughs> yeah. but by so. that same token i mean in in the mummy for example we're like going so oh sorry yeah, but, yeah, okay. right. but but i mean in the mummy you also have this character <laughs> we turned into yeah. another podcast yeah i know <laughs> by accident um you have the character played by by oded fair who's a muslim that's character. right you're right even though he's he's an israeli jew but he plays yeah. a like you're right one of the coolest muslim characters uh, they've, they've depicted, you know. So it's, to be it, fair, you're there's right. nuance. Yeah, you know, there's nuance you're in all right, those things, right, you know. Right. Uh, but on that note, uh, go check out the movie film Raiders of the Lost Ark commentary. You might like it. <laughs> I want to check that out for sure. Yeah, but well, uh, you before so you much. check out that commentary, read John's book yeah. there you go. and uh, be back here uh, in just a few short weeks for our next episode. Uh, thanks to uh, Pervez Ahmed and thanks to our guest John O'Brien for joining us on Diffuse Congruence, and thank you for listening.